Hey guys, this is Mike Colon of the Mike Name Podcast. Uh, welcome back to another episode um, of the show. Um, just a quick reminder, I normally don't do this, but uh, you'll see this at the top of the show on YouTube. And if you're listening, you'll hear this. Um, it was a great interview with Dennis Smith. He joined me for episode 79 of the Mike Name Podcast, volume two of the miniseries, the best of the bravest uh, interviews with the FDNY's elite. I just wanted to step in and, and say it real quick before I, I throw it on over to my interview with Mr. Smith. Um, if uh, the camera looks a little odd on his angle or if you see that his video shuts off, uh, keep in mind, Mr. Smith is 81 years old. He's in his early 80s. Technology is a little bit uh, difficult. Uh, well, it's difficult for all of us. It doesn't matter your age, but uh, especially for uh, those uh, in, in the uh, elderly section of society, shall I say. So um, it was still a very good conversation. He's still very tent man. He's very lucid. But uh, technology is a little bit difficult for him. So um, if you notice that during the course of the interview, uh, and if uh, there might be some pregnant pauses during the interview, uh, um, don't worry, it's, it's because of that. So he was very good. But to, just, a, you know, normally I, I pride myself on a high level production of the show. And I don't think that this show is any different. But if you notice some things that may seem a little off, uh, if you're listening or if you're watching, uh, it's for that reason. He is 81 uh, years old. So without further ado, uh, let's uh, throw it out over to my conversation with Mr. Dennis Smith as we continue the miniseries, The Best of the Bravest. I'll see you at the end of the show. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to episode 79 of the Mike and Aiden podcast. It's going to be a very special edition of the Mike and Aiden podcast today. If you haven't checked out episode 78, I spoke with Associated Press reporter Mike Sizak, in which we talked about uh, what it's like working as a law enforcement reporter in the current climate, as well as his career in general covering the Penn State scandal and amongst other many uh, things that he's covered uh, throughout his career, lasting over 15 years as a reporter. This episode is special because, as you know, we have recently launched a, another mini-series within the podcast called The Best of the Bravest, in which I interview retired members of the FDNY. Volume 1 featured retired uh, Special Operations Command Lieutenant Ray Seeley, who was an expert uh, scuba diver, worked with FEMA, uh, of course, so ran the scuba unit for a while from 2005 to 2006. He was great. And that was volume one. If you haven't checked that out yet, please go do so. Volume two is my next guest, who's a man whose life in the fire service is quite literally one for the books. A native of the east side of Manhattan, he took the city civil service test and soon joined the FDNY as a bright-eyed and bushy-tailed 20-something, ready to fight the many flames the five boroughs had to offer. Joining the bravest just in time for the war years of the 1960s and 1970s. He had a front row seat to witness New York's descent from the apex of the world to quite literally the ashes, specifically if you were living in the Bronx, you know what I'm talking about. An accomplished author, he's written 16 books and is the founder of Firehouse, Ma Firehouse Magazine, excuse me, launching that publication in 1976 amongst his most notable works that he's published, 2002's Report from Ground Zero and 1972's classic Report from Engine Company 82. Dennis Smith joins us now in the Michael Newton Podcast for Volume 2 of The Best of the Bravest. Dennis, welcome. How are you? How are you doing? Thanks a lot. Um, I just want to uh, add on to what you said. Uh, I finished my 17th book, which is called Of Love and Courage. It's not out yet. I'm finding a publisher. And then I'm in the middle of another book about the firehouse and fires and firefighting. And uh, it's really interesting. And so watch for it to come out. Well, I will do so. I, I, I'll definitely be looking to purchase uh, both 17 and 18. Uh, it's called Don't drive. Tell the Mayor. Don't tell. <laughs> now, I definitely want to read it. That title, as if, you know, as if it is interesting enough, now that title, I definitely have to, uh, to purchase it when it comes out. So, yeah, uh, thank you for mentioning that. So, as I mentioned in my introduction of you, you're a native of the east side of Manhattan. Uh, take me through what it was like growing up in 40s and 50s New York. Well, uh, we were, we were, you know, prototypical poor people. And um, the, the, the apartment I grew up in was a railroad flat, very much like the flats I spent my days in and nights in, in the South Bronx. They're the it's minimum standard housing, you know, except it was on 56th Street between 1st and 2nd Avenue. So location-wise, it's a very expensive real estate. So those tenements are long gone, of course. Um, but I had a nice upbringing. I had a great mother. And she cared about me and my brother a lot. She worked hard. Uh, she paid attention. Uh, we didn't get in much trouble when we were kids. 
we had Kips Bay Boys and Girls Club to go to. We went there all the time. My brother went to Cardinal Hayes High School. He was on the basketball team. And uh, he was a good ball player. I, on the other hand, uh, didn't really have any success in school. So I left it in the, after two weeks. And I said, I don't like this. I'm going to get a job. So I went and got a job and became a delivery boy for flower florist. And um, that was it. And I think it was time well spent. I, I finally, I went back to college, you know, many years later, and I got a bachelor's and a master's degree. Well, at least you were able to finish what you started. And, and those times were different, you know, with the economy being what it was, and of course, the New York being different from what it is now. Uh, it wasn't uncommon to see those of the middle school age uh, working jobs and not necessarily going to school. But at least if you weren't getting gaining skill sets in, in education, you were definitely gaining them in the work field. And that's something that uh, benefited a lot of kids one way or the other during that era. So when did you, you know, from being a flower boy to a transition, you know, into a career in the fire service, I'll ask you, when did you start to get interested in the idea of being a civil servant? Well, I took two tests, the police test and the fire test. I passed them both and the fire test, fire department called first. Um, and uh, I took the job. Uh, I can't say that I had great ambitions to be a fireman, except that I knew it was a good job, that the few cops, I only knew one fireman on the block and I knew one cop on the block. So they were good people and uh, commendable. So, uh, you know, I thought it was a good job. And it was, it proved to be a good life, never mind a job. I, I was talking to, uh, be a name dropper. I was talking to Lee Iopi uh, just last night. We had dinner, he, he's in, he was in rescue too. And we were talking about uh, how lucky we were to have this life. It wasn't a job, it was a life. We did everything around the firehouse. You know, our friends were all in, in the firehouse kitchen. We would go away on trips together, go to parties together. Uh, and uh, our life was full, but it was full within the, the definition of the uh, FDNY. So it was a good deal for me. It was much more than a job. Plus, I was able to pay the rent. Um, and, you know, it, to, you know, to bounce off of that, um, Phil Rulo, the great uh, captain for many years of Rescue 2 of the FDNY, uh, has a great quote that it has said a lot in the fire service, and that is, being a fireman isn't what you do, it's who you are. Um, and it's true. I mean, I think anybody that goes into civil service, not just the fire service, but paramedic, nurse, police officer, if you approach it with the right mindset, um, it is a great calling. It is a great life, and it sticks with you for yeah, the entire Yeah, I think that's pretty true. I think that's yeah. very true. It's a, it's a, it's not a calling. I mean, it wasn't a calling for me, but it was something. I quite frankly, I got lucky. You know, I, I uh, saw two ponds in front of me, and I was hot. I wanted to go swimming, and I chose the one pond. I don't know what the other pond was because I never went in it. You know, I only went in the fire department pond. That's the way I look at it. And it was an interesting pond to, to swim in for the amount of time that you uh, swam in it an active, as an active member and still even in retirement, uh, which we'll get to later. So, you know, fire academy training is so interesting to me because obviously a lot goes into it. Any police academy, I've said this before on the show, any police academy you join, any fire academy you join, it's going to be rigorous, especially in a city like New York, because you want to make sure that you're producing the very best to go out there and in their respective capacities, keep the city safe. So during that era, 19, early 1960s, when you were coming on, what was life in the academy like? And, and who were the type of guys that were training you? Well, I, I'll tell you, I say very often in my conversation, you know, can I do this? Can I do that? And I always end up saying, look, I'm FDNY trained and uh, I can do anything. Doesn't matter what we have to do. We'll just get it done. 
and that's the way FDNY is. Uh, but the skills are pretty exacting. You know, firefighting is a team effort. And uh, if the team is not working together, you're not going to do a good job or, uh, you, you know, you may put out the fire, but you may put out the house at the same time. Right. And uh, anyway, it's, it, it, it is a sort of a saintly calling. You know, I mean, if I could quote the, uh, the interior of the firehouse kitchen, uh, which I can't because I'm speaking publicly. And so I got to watch my language. The, uh, the, the fire department is so special with people who are so special. Uh, and the training was so exacting that, uh, you know, just the fact that you go to any fireman and, and you, you ask him to do a bowling arm bite uh, knot and you can step on it and, and he can do it in four seconds and then drop you down the roof, off the roof, and you'll be very safe. And, uh, you know, little skills like that, but there are hundreds of them. And uh, you, you learn that from the bosses in the, uh, in the fire academy. You know, they all were experienced firefighters. Uh, we couldn't wait until they stopped their training like for lunch break or before the lunch, after lunch classes. And they just tell fire stories. And, you know, we were like kids in, the, in school and uh, so anxious for these stories, you know, what happened next? And, uh, and so in my new book, I talk a lot about this. And um, uh, uh, it's necessary. And I guess it's because FDNY is the number one fire department in the world. We had such a training school. And now it's as good, if not better, than it ever was. Because uh, Commissioner uh, Nigro, I believe, was the best commissioner in the history of the New York Fire Department. I mean, he created issues and he solved issues, but he wasn't afraid to create them, you know? And uh, he's a, just a stand-up guy. I'll tell you something, you know, maybe I won't tell you. He, he should write his own book, and that's why I won't tell you. He should write his own book about what he's done in his life. And, um, uh, I, I just admire him. Yeah, he's he's a great he's a great commissioner. He's a great leader. I mean, here was somebody that was thrust. He was already an experienced chief, but you know, uh, on September 11th, which we'll talk about later, when, when Chief Gansey was killed, sadly, uh, in the line of duty. I mean, on the spot, this man had to become the chief of the department, and all of a sudden had to lead this recovery operation, and he did it with a plum, and he did it while grieving himself, you know, and and struggling himself, but he did it. And uh, the department was able to stand up on its feet, not just because of him. I mean, obviously, it was a joint effort to keep the department going, but he had a huge part in making sure that the FDNY didn't fall apart uh, after that day, which we'll get to later. So, I mean, coming out of the academy, you're initially with the engine company 292, I believe, if that's accurate. And I, I believe it is uh, correct. Say it again. Uh, when you came out of the academy, you were initially assigned to engine company 292, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you've read that somewhere, that's for sure. Uh, so <laughs> I have. I, listen, I do, my, I do my homework on that. Whoever it is I talked to yeah. prior to I talking to. I went to 292. I'll tell you why. Uh, it's, I've, I do very few things spontaneously without thinking them too. And I went to, uh, I, you know, when I got in the job, I knew what it was. Uh, no one had to convince me of how important this job is and how important it will be to me and to my life and my family. So I went to 292 inch the engine because I was just finishing a bachelor's degree and I wanted to study for a master's degree. And uh, so I stayed there for a couple of years and I finished my master's degree. And so when I finished my master's degree, I said, uh, 
you know, this it's a great company. It's it's Rescue Four. It's a great firehouse. But I uh, I said I wanted something a little busier, and so uh, Engine Eighty Two was on the top of the list. So I went there. You know, fortunately, I had begun playing the uh, bagpipes, and uh, Tommy Riley was the head of the bagpipes. He was a big union guy. So I gave him a call and I said, hey, Tom, think you can move me over to 82 engine? And uh, uh, he did, came down on the next uh, orders. And so uh, it was a, a whole different life, just going to work. I mean, it's very few times that I ever go to work when the, when the, when the pumpers and the truck were there, you know, in the firehouse. They're always out in a run somewhere. So uh, it was just a different kind of life. It was a fire department. There was no alone time. It was uh, fire, fire, fire. A lot of false alarms and you know, say neighborhood, neighborhood, neighborhood. But uh, there was a lot of work and you learned to do the, do the job. And uh, and then you just you, you know you you look forward to it every day going to work. I mean, when, there's an old saying as well: when you love what you do, that you never work a day in your life. And I mean, I, I'm sure that that was the case with you um, for all those years that you were in the fire service. And we're talking with Dennis Smith here on the Mike Davis Podcast, Volume Two, of the mini series, the best of the bravest interviews with the FDNY's elite. That's uh, for Dennis to join us here. And, um, I, I can sense it in the passion that you have when you talk about your time in the fire service. So I want to dive deeper into your time in Engine Company 82. But before we get to that, proby life, uh, being a proby, it's quite the adjustment period. You got to earn respect around the firehouse. Uh, so when you initially came on, uh, what was life as a proby like and who were the senior men uh, that you would say were most helpful to you? Yeah, you know, it's... Um... It's a very unique time in your life being a probie. Uh, in my new book, I even mentioned a, it's a conversation in the kitchen where somebody says, uh, you know, God made the probies just so they could make the coffee. And that's your job. You always got to have a pot of coffee on the table. And then somebody else said, well, it couldn't have been much of a God if he just made probies. And, uh, and uh, he said, in fact, he didn't have to work on the probies. He should have worked on the coffee. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, that kind of thing. The, 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 the probie was crucial. It was funny. Like, the, the, you know, the, the, the probationary firefighter was, uh, was central to the tour, the day tour, night tour. But he was central to it. And... Uh, and uh, then when you finally get out of your probationary period, you're not central to it anymore, you know, because nobody's saying, where's the probie? You know, why didn't the probie do the tools? Or why didn't the probie do this? Or, you know, your, your days are, uh, are uh, plagued pretty much your own. But when you're a probie, they're not your own. They, they belong to the guys in the firehouse. Absolutely. Um, and, I mean, listen, um, it's good to have that, that training. It's good to, and I had this conversation with Ray Seeley, is that, you know, when, when they're testing you as a probie, they're testing you not because they don't like you, but they're testing you because they want to make sure that, okay, listen, can this guy or gal keep his or her cool when they're on the fire floor. Because if they lose it now, it may bust in their chops uh, with, you know, miscellaneous jokes that are told in the firehouse setting. How are they going to be when fire is flying over their head? And especially in that era, as we're going to talk about right now, fire was flying over your head quite a bit. So 1966 is when you were arrived at Engine Company 82, which at one point, I think, and this, this isn't my verbally to say, was the busiest company in the world, not just in New York City, but in the world, with the amount of runs that you had to go on. Um, and right around this time, 1964 is, uh, is cited as being the beginning 
largely uh, of the FDNY. Yeah, we were doing 9,600 runs a year. My gosh. So they haven't done that many in a few years. The, the busiest companies now are up around 5,500 5, or 6,000. But um, we were 3,000 runs over that. And uh, so you didn't get much time to yourself. You always had a job. But that's part of it, you know. And, and you think of yourself, quite frankly, as a member of a busy company. And it's the idea of this busy company that stays with you. It's a little elitist, quite frankly. And uh, I don't think it's uh, that, that helpful, but you can't help thinking of it that way. Uh, that's, uh, you know, it goes back to what I'd say. Uh, I'm FDNY trained and I can do anything. Well, it's also true being in a company that's doing 9,000 runs a year. Yeah. You know? Absolutely. I mean, that, that's... And the war years, uh, just for my listeners, I'll explain it. So for those of you wondering what the war years of the FDNY were, 1964 to 1978 is largely defined as being the core uh, era of what was the war years. And that is a time when New York City, after a prosperous era, starts to go bad, kind of like what's happening now, unfortunately, although fires aren't being set with the prevalence they were back then, in terms of uh, decline, in terms of crime rate going up, in terms of economic hardship, uh, that was beginning to take New York City over in a negative way to where by the early 1970s, late 1960s, early 1970s, arson was king. People were setting fires to buildings left and right, particularly in the Bronx, hence the uh, infamous uh, nickname, the Bronx is burning. Uh, to define that era for the borough. And the FDNY was really, really busy going to, I think, 20, 22,000 runs in total a year across the city. And so much so, this was encapsulated for any of you that you know, are old school Yankee fans, you remember this. Game three of the 1978 World Series, uh, Yankees are playing the Dodgers. The Yankees are coming back to Yankee Stadium after losing the first two games against LA, out in LA. And they would eventually win this World Series in six games for their second straight title. But they're in a hole, game three, down two nothing. The World Series is being broadcast on ABC, and they pan out outside of the stadium to the rest of the Bronx. Yeah, and they see a job. Yeah. And that, then they see flames flying uh, left and right from numerous buildings, to which Howard Cosell, in that classic voice of his, remarks infamously, the Bronx is burning. And uh, that uh, really encapsulated what you guys had to go through. So the peak of it, given you know the amount of fires, is largely believed to be somewhere between 1969 and 1974. Um, how do you, I mean, I, I don't know how else to ask this. You're going on so many runs. And yeah, it's good to be busy, but as you said, you didn't have any alone time. How does one battle burnout Battle fatigue, not just body fatigue, not just the physical rigors of firefighting, but to me the mental rigors too. Uh, I mean, you know, your body just gets used to it. I mean, Willie Knapp was the longest knob man in 82 engine. He was there 32 years. And uh, you got to respect that, you know, getting up at four o'clock in the morning for 32 years. Uh, yeah. And uh, he didn't see today. He does, still doesn't seem tired. He still has some energy. It's uh, uh, and it's uh, it's it's not, it's a debilitating job in that it definitely plays a part in uh, your health. And uh, I had had a throat cancer, and I've had a heart aneurysm. I've had a pacemaker. I've had uh, all these things that were a result of, uh, I think, the tensions of firefighting, which nobody has really written about. But there's a lot of tension in that job. Uh, and particularly when people in a job where people start getting hurt, you know. Uh, and you gotta get one person out and one another person in because you gotta get the job done. Uh, but that comes with the territory, and you get you get used to it. I imagine and, uh, Yeah, I didn't have any trouble getting used to it. You know, 
I think, yeah, I, you know, for as rigorous as you can be, I imagine one does after a while because routine does become, well, just that routine in which, you know, it's hard at first. It's kind of like, I, and this is my apples to oranges comparison, but I guess it's kind of understandable in that daylight savings time, right? At the beginning, everybody's a little bit thrown off by the clock adjustment. You know, you're waking up and it's like, wait a minute, isn't it supposed to be this time? But your body's still, you know, getting accustomed to it. And after a while it does and it sinks in. And you're able to continue on with life uh, per usual. So I, I imagine that but this part's interesting too, because during this time, uh, the fire patrol is in existence and the fire patrol would be uh, in existence until 2006. And for those of you listening that are wondering what the New York fire patrol was, they were not too dissimilar to the fire department. Their mission was to protect life and property like the fire department's mission is. But what the fire patrol would do that was a bit different from the FDNY is that while the fire department is battling the fire, trying to put out the fire, the fire department would go in and make sure that too much damage was not done to an individual building, pumping out excess amounts of water, uh, bagging property so that property wouldn't be damaged and taking it out of harm's way. They did a great job of that. Um, they lost their fair share of members in the line of duty along the years as well. The last one being Keith Roma, who was killed at the World Trade Center on September 11, 2001. Um, but nonetheless, they were a great asset to the fire department, um, as history would tell you. So from your vantage point, the fire patrol, uh, how much of a help were they to you personally, the men of engine company 82? I never saw them. You never saw them? Never. Okay, never mind. <laughs> that nullifies that question. They didn't go to the places like the South Bronx. They had contracts with, you know, Macy's and Gimbel's and uh, all the stores, Tiffany's. And that's how the, uh, they had contract with the uh, insurance companies that insured those stores. And so that's where they were. They were downtown, accessible to all those places on Fifth Avenue and Madison Square, Madison Avenue. Uh, and it was a job for those guys, uh, for sure. You know, they were they, uh, they were not in the fire department, but they were in a unique business of their own. And they had a job to do, and they did it. Right. I, I, I know that, you know, listen, obviously, it's, it's the nature of the job. That anybody that signs up to be a police officer, signs up to be a firefighter, they know the dangers of what they're getting themselves into. And there exists the ever present possibility that when you walk out the door to go on a shift, you might not be coming home. Um, and that's been the sad reality and sad realization for a lot of brave men and women over the years that walked out the door to go do their job and never came back. Um, for one reason or another. And so during this time, numerous members were lost, of course, and um, so many fires in, in a city that large, you're gonna unfortunately lose quite a bit of, of people. Um, Any time that you would hear of a fireman losing their life in the line of duty in the city, you have to keep going, obviously, but when you would hear the news, would it give you pause and, and would you give deep thought uh, about the dangers of the job? Or was there so much fire at that time and so many runs that you really didn't have time to think about your own mortality? Well, no, if it's, 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 somebody gets hurt, you try to visit him in the hospital, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, and if he's seriously hurt or burned, you know, you especially do that. If somebody dies, you're definitely going to go to the funeral, you know? That's what firemen do. I was just, uh, I just saw the, all the films from Charlie McCarthy's funeral, which was just last Saturday. And uh, I couldn't go there because I'm not physically able to get up to Salzburg, New York. But it was wonderful watching my old friends at that funeral, uh, guys like the, the Valenzano brothers and Bob Beatley and, and uh, Tom Simmons and, and they, they, everybody was there. And uh, uh, it, it's even now that they're out of the job for 20 and 30 years, they still showed up. And it was, uh, it was great to see them all. Absolutely, I, I mean, obviously under some somber circumstances, um, but nonetheless, it is good to see people, especially now, I mean, obviously with this coronavirus pandemic, it's so difficult to see people and, and as we 
slowly can begin to see people in our lives again, cautiously, of course, you're reminded of how important it is to stay in touch with those that either, you know, not only in your family, but those that become part of your family. Of course, you work in a firehouse long enough and they become an extension of your family. They're your family away from uh, home. And, and uh, you know, the firehouse does eventually become home if you're in the profession uh, long enough. So 1972, this is pretty much the peak of the war years. And you're smack dab in the middle of, of this 14 year period of just sheer ins insanity with the amount of runs that you're going on. And that's when really what many believe is the definitive book on the fire service, or at least one of the definitive books is, is published. And here you are less than a decade on the job at the time when Report from Engine Company 82 was published. And it chronicles life on the fire service during this insane time and in a company that was uh, just on an insane schedule. Um, when you published this book, well, first, what inspired you to write it? And, and second, did you face some backlash from the upper brass of the FDNY in downtown Manhattan, or, or Brooklyn, better yet, excuse me, for publishing this book? No, I don't think so. You know, the, the people have various mindsets, and they usually follow their mindset. Uh, but the firefighters I work with, you know, they were fine with it. Uh, as long as you, you know, it's, it's like everything in firefighting. As long as you don't make yourself the hero of your own narrative. Uh, you know, they take you it's according to what you produce. You know, they make a judgment about you. That's, it's always a fair judgment. So uh, I didn't think much about anything. Uh, when they called me, you know, to write this book, I didn't call them. And, um, um, and it started from my interest in literature. And uh, so I wrote a letter about uh, William Butler Yeats and uh, the Irish poet, and uh, the New York Times published it. It was very interesting to me because the consequence was that a publishing company called and they sent a, a woman over to uh, to um, interview with me and then they offered me this assignment to write this book, Engine 82. So that's how it happened. Uh, and it's still in print and it's up, you know, close to 4 million copies that it sold. And uh, the next one is going to do even better. Ah, hopefully. Because, yeah, the, the next one is, uh, firefighting has changed a lot. Now, it, it, what, what interests me, I still like the inside of the fire, you know, with the, with the, uh, with the advancing get in inch by inch on your belly. But uh, I like the, uh, the special incidents too. You know, the accidents, drug overdoses, the things where you're, you're, it's an emergency service, but you're essentially doing the work of other people, you know, of, uh, of uh, medics, uh, psychiatrists, social workers. And, uh, and I like that part of the job too, because it's you, you're one-on-one -on -one helpful to people. Absolutely, and you know, as you said, four million copies, that's the equivalent to a, of a platinum album that a band would put out or any individual artist would put out. Uh, and almost 50 years, I mean, it'll be 50 years next year that the book came out. Uh, for that to still be the case and the book to still be doing so well, it's incredible. I mean, you, you there's no way you couldn't have envisioned, that you could have envisioned, I should say, uh, the book having this much success. I'm sure you thought it would do well on a local level and certainly amongst the members of the department and certainly amongst the residents of the city that were, were seeing what was happening. But to, to, to see this book achieve what it's achieved and, and become one of the more recognized books of the fire service, uh, well, I imagine know, that's a very humbling feeling. There, there were, lots, were lots of books published before Engine, 80, Engine Company 82. Uh, uh, at least four of them that I can remember. And uh, I read them. But when I decided to do my book, well, there are two things that are very important. 
Number one was the narrative that describes Engine 82 itself. It describes this amazing company with these amazing people doing this amazing amount of work. And um, I got to say, since Lee Aoki is such a good friend of mine, I got to say here that uh, it's a little different from the rescue too, which did, did amazing and wonderful work on their own. But, uh, but uh, I think that uh, I had such an opportunity in Engine Company 82 with that book that I decided that I would do this narrative about the company itself. And then uh, number two, I would tell the story of the firefighters and you know, I would, I would make myself the onlooker. I do that with my, 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 the book I'm writing now, Don't Tell the Mayor. Uh, uh, and you know, I don't think anybody wants to hear about uh, making myself the number one subject of a book, you know? Right. But, but uh, I was there and I was privileged to be there. And so I can tell the truth and people respect me for telling the truth. And uh, so uh, I do. And, and you know, if, if I'm involved in it, uh, it's probably going to be pretty accurate. Oh, that's the goal. I think anytime somebody writes something, nobody likes anybody that suits their own horn. Nobody uh, likes something like someone that is self-aggrandizing uh, in their in their work. And, and one does not get that sense from you, obviously. And I think any author that is writing something that is nonfiction um, has to understand this. And, and you don't have to be an expert on writing books to understand this. Is that you are, if you were there, if you lived it, you are a witness to that history, and all you can do is chronicle what you saw. And if you're good at what you do, which you are, of course, as an author, uh, you detach yourself from anything that you might have done, um, largely to focus on just what you saw. Because the, these events, I mean, that 14 year period was way bigger than anybody in the FDNY. And I think obviously now, for anybody that was in the thick of that period, um, you know, that, that's something that they understand clearly. Yeah. And the fire department was very lucky, you know, during this period to have one of the best fire chiefs in history, uh, who was John O'Hagan, used to read his book. And uh, uh, th th this is a guy who really knew what he was doing, you know, and he was 36 years old and he became chief of department. Uh, uh, no one was going to tell him what to do. He knew what what had to be done at every job, and he was good at it, and the job was very lucky to have him during those years. Yeah, the leadership at the top is something that, in anything, the example is set at the top, and if you don't have good leadership, you can, and it reflects who you have working under you, but if you do, um, obviously the reflection is all the same, except it's, it's a positive one. You see that now with Commissioner Nigro, you've seen it previously, with other men that have uh, worked in the FDNY over the years. I mean, you mentioned Rescue 2. Ray Downey led Rescue 2 for a number of years uh, before becoming a chief. The late Ray Downey who lost his life on 9-11. I mentioned Chief Gancy, Bill Fian, uh, another guy that uh, was, was great at what he did and was a great leader. So, you know, working as an author, I have to say, I mean, it's I, I've had a couple of authors uh, on this show. It's, it's not easy. You, if you're a good writer, you make it look easy, but it's not to put a book together, to, to get all the interviews together, to make sure that you have all your, uh, you know, mental documents of events accurate. So from your experience as someone that's written 16 books and has number 17 and 18 on the way, what is the hallmark sign of a good author? Um, you know, you're, I did work as a professor of English for one year at the College of New Rochelle. And uh, I didn't know then, I don't know now, the answer <laughs> to that question. Uh, I, the, the, it just has to do with, I think, Hemingway was right about it, first of all. You gotta have internal crap detectors. You gotta know what's BS and what's not. 
when you're writing, you know, you got to have that feel for it. Hemingway had it, and I hope and I strive for it. And, and the other thing is, uh, you got to stick with it. If you if you think that your book is very worth reading, that every page has got to be worth turning the page. There's got to be a anticipation in it, and uh, and. Uh, and uh, I realize that, and that's what I work for when I write, that it, every page has some kind of, I wonder what's going to happen next element. And, uh, uh, and that, to me, comes pretty naturally. I liked being a teacher. I taught for one year, as I told you. But... Uh, uh, but I, would, I was doing it while I was at engineering too. And it was just too much for me. I think after uh, a while, anybody can, you know, with all that you did uh, understand something like that. So uh, I want to get to the founding of Firehearts Magazine in a moment, which Kurt mentioned 76. But one last note on the Warriors. Uh, the city really, I mean, the city was already beginning to have economic troubles in the late 1960s and the 1970s. But when the fiscal crisis hit under Mayor Lindsay, I believe, that's when everything really took a turn for the worse. And it took a while for the city to get out of that. And of course, it produced the infamous headline. I think, I believe it was the New York Times that said, Ford to city, drop dead. <laughs> We're in reference to President Gerald Ford. So, it, was, it was the Daily News. It was the Daily News. Okay, thank you. I, was, I, I knew it was either one of the three, the Post, the Times, or the Daily News. So it was the Daily News. But that you had know, that Abraham Beam was the... Uh, mayor at that time okay. he was an accountant uh, he uh, he was not a bad mayor but he certainly wasn't in the parameters of a good mayor you know he just he was there holding the ship straight for a little while but he had no imagination uh, if he would have had imagination, it, was, it took uh, Hugh Carey, anybody who studies that period, it took Hugh Carey, who was the governor, to come out of that crisis. And uh, he wouldn't let the city go bankrupt. And um, uh, they developed a plan and they got to it anyway. So that was a serious time, though. There, there was like 300 firemen laid off, right? Yeah. And, and uh, so you're gonna have to go to that last question because I'm, I'm I have to, my nurse came back wherever she is. All right, so we'll uh, we'll go to uh, uh, a few more questions here, and, and Dennis Smith, you've been very generous with your time. Uh, actually, uh, I'll have to bring you back for another time, but we'll get to the uh, concluding segment segment of this podcast. It's called Rapid Fire. It's five quick hit and run questions from me. And five answers from you, and uh, we'll, get, we'll get to it. We'll get you out of here because I know you're busy. So the first one is, uh, best piece of advice anyone ever gave you? You're going to have to say that again. Uh, my apologies. As we have the segment here on the podcast called Rapid Fire. Uh, five hit-and-run questions from me, five answers from you. It's five very quick uh, hit-and-run questions. I know you're busy, and you've been generous with your time. So the first one is, best piece of advice anyone ever gave you? Uh you know that there was an admiral who wrote a book recently and his his piece of advice was you know get up in the morning and make your bed and that's the best thing you can do because it's a goal it takes an effort and you can accomplish it and that is you have to, you have to think about life you have to think about what you're doing what your goals are and how you accomplish them uh, i was fortunate in that i never had to think of myself as anything but part of a bigger team. And so I had to think of how the team was doing and how we acted at jobs and, you know, um, when we had, because every, every job comes with a special challenge, you know, you never know what you're gonna meet in a firehouse, in a, in a, in a fire, rather. Uh, uh, so that's the answer, the answer just to, it's just the best piece of advice is it's the Boy Scout advice. You remember, be prepared. Be prepared, indeed. Uh, second favorite colleague or colleagues you ever worked with? 
that I ever worked with? Yes. You asking me to name their names? Well, you can <laughs> any names that come to mind. You know, you can say whoever no, you want to name. I can't do that. Are you kidding? <laughs> so, they come over and hit me with an axe or a power game tool. So we'll go to the third one then. Uh, funniest call you ever responded to? Funniest? Funniest call, yes. Well, I just wrote about it and it's in my new book. And so I hate to give it away, but. So, no, you don't have to. That's fine. It, it, was, but it was great. It was about a woman who lived with her two sisters for 20 years uh, and told them she was sick and there was not a thing wrong with her. And uh, she had the more bulldozed, you know. So if you want to read about that uh, call in depth, you'll have to buy this Dennis Smith's next book. Uh, second to last question, the fourth one of the, uh, of the five. Uh, what is one thing people will be surprised to learn about you? What would they be surprised? Well, that you, I don't know. It's a, it's, a, it's a kind of a celebrity question, you know, and I never think of myself as a celebrity. All right. So uh, you can, you can pass on that one if you want. So, um, but but one of the things they don't know, I have an opportunity now to talk about myself. Um, I play eight musical instruments. Wow. So that's nobody knows. And something else I do is I, I'm able to paint quite well. You know, I'm a good painter. In fact, I'm gonna show you one painting of mine, which is right here. Well, I see one of uh, Mr. Smith's uh, fine portraits here. See in that moment. painting? Yes. For those of you that will watch this on YouTube, you can see that. It's a painting of a beautiful, for those of you that were listening, it's a beautiful painting of a lighthouse uh, with birds flying. It's on a beachfront. It's just beautifully. It's a lighthouse. And uh, that is, that is, that's incredible. That's, that's very uh, well really? done. Yeah. Absolutely. I'm glad you I'm showed a good me. painter. I can see that. Yeah, you it's are. It's it looks incredible. It looks incredible. Um, the last question here that uh, I will ask you, and uh, then I'll, I'll, I'll get you out of here, is what advice would you give a young firefighter coming on the job now? Well, I'll tell you what. A lot of people, because this is a question that that, uh, you know, I have thought a lot about. Right. Uh, because it's the young firefighters who will be fighting the fires, you know, 20, 30 years from now. And uh, there's certain things that I think that they should do. First of all, different from what I did. Uh, when I come on a job, it was my idea. It's just to integrate myself into this group uh, of firefighters. And um, in 292 and Rescue 4, I was the probe. It wasn't very easy to do. I didn't get my um, uh, challenges worked up too much. Uh, but and, and I had a lot of good times in the firehouse. Well, I think that if I would came on the job today, I wouldn't think of it that way. Uh, I would think, what can I do to make myself better at what I'm doing? Like uh, this firefighter I'm writing about is when he gets assigned to a certain company, he drives all around the neighborhood and he checks out, he's with a friend and he checks out the building and his friend knows construction, he knows construction. And they sort of talk about what it would be like to have a job in that building. You know, particularly the big or the awkward buildings in the company district. And uh, so that's just one little thing that he did that, you know, beginning firefighters don't think of doing mostly because these are the places that are gonna get you in trouble in a job, if you ever have a job in that building. 
you know, the big spaces and the old spaces. Uh, and so you should uh, learn something about it. And that's what I would do. I would you know, go, go and try to learn as much as I could about this job uh, and what it's going to show me in the future. Absolutely. Somebody that used to do that, uh, sadly, he's no longer with us as well. Uh, another casualty of, of September 11th is that is Captain Terry Hatton of Rescue One. Uh, Paul Hassig had talked about it, not on this show, but in the documentary, still writing, um, in which Captain Hatton would take the New York Times and look at the uh, economy section, I believe, not just you know to find out what the stocks were doing, as Paul put it, but to find out what it was going to do to the buildings in New York City and how it's going to affect the construction. The rationale being, we're going to have to respond to these buildings eventually. So it's good to know about these things ahead of time. That way, when the emergency comes, we'll be prepared. Uh, so on that note, uh, that concludes what's been a, a very nice edition of the Mike and Ava podcast, The Best of the Bravest, uh, Volume uh, 2, of course. So uh, I very much appreciate you uh, joining, uh, Mr. Smith. And before we go, I usually have our, my guests promote themselves and I promote myself and we get out of here. Is there anything besides, of course, the two books that you have on the way? Besides that. Is there anything else that you'd like to promote? Uh, one second, your microphone is uh, on mute. Unmute yourself there, click that, click that button. Okay, now it's unmuted. Uh, is the video stopped? No, we're, uh, we're still going. As I was asking you, is there anything besides the two new books you have on the way? Uh, yeah, no, you, no, 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 uh, uh, no. There's, there's not much going on, uh, um, except I, you know, try to keep as close to my children who are all adults and doing okay in their lives. But uh, it's always nice to have, be around them. So thank you very much. It was uh, uh, painless and uh, you're a good interviewer and I enjoyed this time with you, okay? Thank you. And I appreciate you joining and, and, and you take care and I'll bring you back when it's uh, not so crazy in your schedule and we'll okay. talk some more. Take care of yourself. You right too. Bye-bye. Yeah. All right. And that concludes uh, what's going to be episode. All right, guys, I'm back. It's Mike Cody again. I uh, am glad that, uh, or at least I hope you enjoyed uh, that episode with Dennis Smith. I'm glad that I was able to talk to him. He's a very uh, great guy and uh, 81 years old. Like I said, still lives it, but of course the technology aspects a little bit foreign to him. Zoom was a bit foreign to him. So we had a little bit of trouble with that, but nonetheless, uh, I hope that uh, you enjoyed. He's a busy guy. He's got a lot going on. So I did the best I could with it. And we still talk for 50 minutes. So uh, normally I promote myself at the end. He didn't promote himself very much, but he does have two books uh, coming soon. If you want to check that out, he does have a website too. Uh, DennisSmith.com, so uh, you can find his work there. On my end, if you don't know by now, you can follow me on Twitter at Mike in New Haven. You can, of course, follow me on LinkedIn, Mike Cologne. Just type in Mike Cologne, uh, C-O-L-O-N is how you spell my last name, M-I-C apostrophe D, and I'll pop up and you can um, connect with me on LinkedIn. Instagram, I'm original underscore MC1, and my YouTube channel is MC's audio, MC apostrophe S audio. As far as what's on tap for the Mike and Haven podcast, uh, of course, you've been seeing my best ofs. I've been putting together a best ofs reel uh, as of late. Um, so there's that. If you want to check that out on my YouTube channel, uh, there'll also be an audio version of a best of coming soon. And uh, I hope, I don't know for certain, but I'm going to try to confirm uh, Tuesday, I will be talking with Kirk Minahan of uh, Barstool Sports. He's also a uh, former uh, top uh, rated personality on the radio in Boston, uh, formerly of WEEI. He's also uh, coming to the news recently as a true crime podcaster. Uh, his recent work on a podcast called The Case uh, helped bring attention to uh, the cases of two missing women, uh, both in Boston in 1989 uh, and uh, in North Carolina, or excuse me, South Carolina in uh, 2019, both linked to the same man. So Kirk and I, if he confirms, we'll be talking about that. But in the event that uh, Kirk does not come on, um, I just want to say that I'll be taking a, a brief hiatus from the podcast uh, for the remainder of this month. I've just got some other projects going on, some other things I want to attend to. So I won't be around. There won't be any episodes coming out uh, for the remainder of this month. But keep in mind that uh, I will be back in July. I'm working on getting some great guests for July and beyond. And there'll be new episodes then. So if I see you with Minahan, I hope you enjoy that episode. And if I don't, I just want to say enjoy the summer. And I'll see you next month. So on behalf of Dennis Smith, I'm Michael Owen. We will see you.
next time. Take care.